यो रेडियो नेपाल हो अ गोपाल बस्नेतबाट समाचार सुन्नुस् सेती अञ्चल को आसाम जिल्ला को सदरमुकाम मंगल सेन को सुरक्षार्थ तैनात सुरक्षा फौज को टोली माथि सशस्त्र महाबादी आतंकारीहरू को टुलो जथाले हिजो राति गरे को आक्रमणमा जम्मा एक से दुई जना को दुखत निधन भएको छ सर्वप्रथम यस प्रसारण का प्रमुख समाचार रुकुम को खारामा गैराती सुरक्षा फौज माथि आक्रमण गर्ने आतंक कारीहरूमाथि सुरक्षा फौजले गरे को प्रतिकारमा ठुलो संख्यामा आतंक कारीहरू हताहत हालसम एक से बाउन नजना आतंक कारी को लास प्राप्त Traditionally, the social life of Nepal is divided into different levels. Caste and other strata divisions have shaped most of the country's social, economic, and political life. The dramatic political changes of 2046 greatly increased people's aspirations for social progress and greater equality. However, Although some statistical indicators of the early 1990s showed positive progress in the economy, the living standards of most people remain the poorest of the poor. Around this time, some analysts were quick to point out that the deep-rooted socio-economic conditions in Nepal were conducive to armed conflict. He warned of the possibility of a radical transformative movement to voice his long-standing grievances. The Nepalese monarchy has a long history of suppressing dissent, oppressing the rural poor and marginalized groups, and ruling with an iron fist while erasing the language, religion, and culture of tribal tribes. In 1960, King Mahendra dissolved the elected government and established a one-party system called the Panchayat. This system ended in 1990, after the pro-democracy movement, but the monarchy retained considerable power. Maoist accused the monarchy of being corrupt and undemocratic. In March 1995, the newly formed Nepal Communist Party, Maoist, began planning to launch an armed struggle against the state, dubbed the People's War. On 2052, MOG 21, the CPN, Maoist, submitted 40-point demands to the government, which were broadly addressed to the social, economic, and political agenda, and warned that if the demands were not met, they would start an armed struggle. One week after that, in 2052, Falgun 1, the CPN Maoists, started an armed rebellion against the government. During the next decade, the insurgency, which was initially considered a small problem of law and order in a remote part of rural Nepal, developed into a strong and often barbaric armed conflict that affected the entire country. Throughout the duration of the conflict, there were widespread violations by both the government security forces and the CPN, Maoist, sides. There were incidents of abuse. Out of the 75 districts in Nepal, records of conflict-related murders were recorded in all districts except Manang and Mustang. 
who joined their groups didn't work for them. Operation Romeo was an operation by the royal police to suppress the Maoist movement in Nepal. Occurring in November 1995, it resulted in human rights abuses, the arrest of 132 people, the displacement of 6,000 locals, and an unknown level of rape and torture. During the operation, more than 12 people were killed and there was intense violence against the locals. The culprits have not been arrested. This operation was one of the causes of the Nepali Civil War that started three months later, in February 1996. In the events leading up to the Nepali People's War, 1996-2006, there were many conflicts between police and citizens in Rolpa District and Rukum District. यो तरिकाले हामी अब विकास गर्दै यसलाई हाम्रो पार्टीको एउटा प्रवृत्तिको रूपमा एउटा विचारको धाराको रूपमा एउटा राजनीतिक धाराको रूपमा हामी 21 औं शताब्दीमा अहिलेको भूमण्डलीकृत साम्राज्यवादमाथि अटैक गर्न जाँदै छ 1991-92 the maoists successfully established a political boundary in rolpa that led to a government crackdown on communist inroads after that many political workers employees and teachers were arrested and tortured Instead of addressing the situation politically and peacefully, the government resorted to heavy repression and launched Operation Romeo, Rolpa major operation, especially in the eastern part of Rolpa. With the collusion of the Congress and the UML, the leaders took the police to the villages, surrounded them and mobilized the goons on a large scale at the local level to push the people into further suffering. Various conspiracies took place and people started being beaten in villages. The burning of all the houses in the village, torturing women with sticks in the vagina after gang rape, looting of people's property, taking away money and jewelry, etc., were done by the police in the name of Operation Romeo. Ruthless, undemocratic, and passive activities were carried out as campaigns in Rolpa and Rukum districts. In September 1995, members of the Nepal Communist Party, Maoist Center, planned to launch a people's war with their ideology of democracy and the elimination of feudalism. The hill districts of Rolpa and Rukum were used for preparations for war, and in November, these operations drew the attention of the government, which sought to suppress the movement. Then Home Minister Kum Bahadur Khadka, along with the Nepali Congress-led government, created an operation code named Romeo. In early November 1995, Operation Romeo was carried out by the royal police to win the hearts and minds of the people. This happened mainly in Rolpa district, but Dong district and Rukum district have also been affected. Chuda Bahadur Shrestha led the operation with 2,200 armed police. The operation was said to be launched to control criminal activity, although Human Rights Watch called it an operation focused on eliminating the militant Maoist presence in the region. Operation Romeo led to human rights violations, rape and torture on an unknown scale, the arrest of 132 people, and the displacement of 6,000 locals. During the operation, more than 12 people were killed, and there was intense violence against the locals. The criminals have not been arrested. Three months later, the Nepalese civil war was declared by the Maoists. It was no secret that the Maoists were starting a people's war. The CPN, Maoist, and its legal platform, 
the United People's Front, and popular organizations have been saying since the new constitution was made in 2047 that they should destroy the parliamentary system, including the monarchy, through armed struggle and establish a new democratic system in parliament, in street protests, in small and large general meetings, and in their newspapers. Even before the beginning of the People's War on 2052 Falgun 1, people were widely propagating the necessity of armed struggle by holding hundreds of small and large mass meetings across the country in the name of Jan Morsha and various people's organizations. In those meetings, the speakers openly said that if the government did not take initiative to solve the problems of the people, they would now fight with arms. However, neither the parliamentary parties nor the palace believed this. Even the then royal army, police, administration, and foreign players did not believe this threat from the Maoists. Although the Maoists openly propagated the policy of armed struggle, they kept things like how, on what date, and from where the armed struggle would start completely secret. Also, all matters related to this preparation were kept completely secret. Since it was a party formed after a long struggle, the Maoist party was successful in keeping such serious work and plans of a military nature completely secret. The main issue was the question of how to start the armed struggle, which was resolved in the third extended meeting held in 2051 in Falgun. It was said in the document passed in that meeting, how to transform into a party of armed struggle. Does it gradually transform into a reformist struggle and a small-scale resistance struggle? Or does it require a leap, a deconnect from the old, a decisive step, and a big push? Can our party enter the armed struggle easily, without causing any particular damage to its basic class and organizational structure? In response, it was said, transformation from one process to another is not expansion-expansion, but by leaps and qualitative changes. Leap, qualitative change, and revolution are not gradual developments, but states of disruption. The essence of Marxist dialectic is that, in order to transform ideas into practice, one should plan a leap, not a gradual development from the conscious side. Therefore, after the idea is formed, the transformation of our party, which is not engaged in armed struggle, into a party engaged in armed struggle, can only be done through the process of qualitative change of push and leap. Based on this Marxist dialectical approach, the plan to start the People's War was also made as a big push, a qualitative leap, and a great leap. In other words, the plan to start the People's War was made in the form of a mass uprising. In this way, plans and forms of struggle were made to mobilize not only the party's entire ranks, but also all the supporters. Accordingly, armed and unarmed propaganda operations were planned to be carried out widely. Among these were leaflets, posters, walling, cartoons, guerrilla processions, torch processions, house-to-house -house propaganda, etc., in favor of the People's War. In the second form of People's War, sabotage and siege were kept, which means, in a planned manner, seizing or damaging economic mechanisms owned by feudal lords, landlords, brokers, bureaucratic capitalists, and the government, as well as the houses and properties of local fraudsters and spies, blocking government communication and traffic, damaging power lines, telephone towers, etc. Guerrilla warfare was the third form of people's war. Under this, armed raids, ambushes, and various other attacks were carried out against the police. However, during the beginning of the People's War, the action to eliminate, kill, the class enemy was not carried out. Even in the action of attacking the police station, the instructions of the Central Committee were that the police should not be killed, or killed as much as possible. The instructions were to surrender to the police 
and take possession of the weapons through emergency action as much as possible. The intention of this policy was that there should be no killings on the part of the party first. In the first plan of the People's War, the Central Committee made a plan to carry out six to 8,000 operations across the country, including propaganda operations, sabotage and siege operations, and guerrilla operations. The People's War started in 2052, Falgun 1. About 6,000 such actions were completed within a month. On the day of the beginning of the People's War, six major operations were completed. These six actions were leadership and decisive. These actions were as follows. Attack on the police, station at Atabiskot Radiyula, in Rukum. Attack on the police, station at Holeri in Rolpa. Attack on the police, station at Sindhuligarhi in Sindhuli. Sabotage of the small farmer project office of the Agricultural Development Bank at Changli in Gorka extortion and seizure of lakhs of tamsuk, grain and property from a usurious feudal lord in Kavra sabotage of the Pepsi-Cola factory in Kathmandu is included. The commissioner of Rukum action was Hemant Prakash Oli, Sudarshan, and the chief commander was Ganeshman Poon. This guerrilla team of 39 people included fighters from Rukum, Jajarkot, Dolpa and Salyan. This team was divided into different teams. The main assault team commander was Daulat Vikram Garti, who was martyred later. The task of this team was to break the gate of the post and seize the weapons and explosives. There was another reserve team whose responsibility was to surround the outpost and support the assault team if necessary. Another was the medical team, whose responsibility was to treat injured comrades. Another was the siege team, whose responsibility was to seize the goods. It also included three women guerrillas, among whom Kamala Roca later became a minister. About half of these 39 people were later martyred. According to the decision to carry out the outpost attack at night, all the guerrilla teams gathered in a village about four to five hours away from the Radizula outpost and had dinner. The team led by Ganeshman Pun reached Radizula around midnight. It is a village with a small market and is situated along the river on the border of Jajarkot and Rukum. There was a police station right next to the bridge. After all the teams reached the checkpoint, Commander Ganeshman Pun climbed the wall built on the bridge and ordered the attack now. The team led by Dolat Gyarti started breaking the gates of the post with axes. The other team took the post. Guerrillas entered after breaking the door and asking the policeman to surrender. The poor policeman, not even knowing what was happening, raised their hands and started crying in surrender. Daulat then reminded them that we have come to start a people's war and ordered the guerrillas to seize all the goods. The guerrillas seized all the explosives, gelatin, and pumice wire, and detonators were brought to make the road to the checkpoint. The police tied up all of them and left them sleeping inside the outpost. The guerrillas did not know that the outpost in charge went with one of his weapons to report to the headquarters every month, so the weapons were not captured. The action was successful. The friends got excited and seized all the clothes from a cloth shop in the market. They returned with as much as they could carry, threw the clothes they couldn't carry into the river, and reached the predetermined village. After the beginning of the People's War on 2052 Falgun 1, and the government also starting heavy repression, a meeting of the Politburo was held in Siangja on 2052 Falgun 10 to consult on how to continue the People's War, in which all the major leaders were present. In addition to reviewing the initiatives of the People's War, this meeting also formulated the future strategy. 
Four points are mentioned under the title of the future strategy of the proposal passed in that meeting. In the first point, it is said that, despite all the peculiarities, the nature of the Nepali People's War is long-term. In the current state of the balance of power, the enemy wants to draw us into an immediate, decisive battle. We want to escape from there and prolong the fight. The enemy adopts the strategy of attack, while we adopt the strategy of defense. We want to strike at his weak point at a convenient time and place. In the second point, it is said that the enemy wants to separate us from the movement that is being conducted on the daily problems of the people. We want to lose our contact with the people, but we do not want to be separated from our living contact with them at any cost. In the third point, it is said that the danger of forming wrong policies and plans in the party is also inherent in the fickle nature of the lower capitalist class in Nepal. This class has the character of being overexcited, going on an adventure with a small victory and taking the path of surrender after being disappointed with a small defeat. We should continue to wage a tireless theoretical political struggle against this tendency to lead the party in either an audacious or surrenderous direction. In the current situation, where the enemy's attack is intensifying, the surrenderous tendency can be the main threat to the party. In the fourth point, it is said that the historical initiative of the People's War is definitely a rebellion against the existing state power, but it is not an armed rebellion to seize the central power. The long-term People's War is the process of building a revolutionary party, revolutionary struggle, revolutionary power, and revolutionary army from simple to complex. In a situation where People's War has already been initiated, it is now necessary to focus on the development of guerrilla warfare based on the principles of People's War and our uniqueness. Based on the above fundamental ideological beliefs, the CPN, Maoists, created the second plan of the People's War. The main slogan of the second plan was, Develop guerrilla warfare in a planned manner. This plan had three goals. First, mass mobilization in favor of guerrilla warfare. Second, to seize weapons in a planned manner. Thirdly, to concentrate all the activities of the party to turn certain areas of the western, central, and eastern regions into guerrilla areas. For the implementation of this plan, a brief action plan was also prepared on four topics. Ideological preparation, organizational preparation, technical preparation, and struggle preparation. As part of the ideological preparation, it became a policy to arrange training for workers in all sectors to accelerate the propagation of party lines and policies within and outside the party through statutory and underground publications, and to mobilize statutory associations, organizations, and independent individuals to create public opinion in favor of the party. As part of the organizational preparation, a far-reaching decision was also made that the center and all the regions should arrange an alternative shelter even during migration according to their own suitability. This meant that the center, Prachanda, also meant to arrange shelter, place of residence in India. And all the regions also meant to arrange residence in India for all the major leaders who were in charge of the regional command at that time. After this decision, Prachanda, Baburam, Badal, Gaurav, and other leaders fled to India and started taking shelter in India. Mohan Vaidya, Kiran, stayed underground in Kathmandu for some time. Vaidya was in charge of the Valley Special Command. After some time, Vaidya also went to live in India with a shelter. Although these leaders came to Nepal in between, they stayed in India for about nine years out of ten years. The real people's war in Nepal was led by young leaders. The meeting also decided to change the responsibilities of various leaders in organizational preparations. Biplav was transferred to Karnali, Hitman Shakya to the east, and Rabindra Shrestha from the east to the valley. 
Hisala Yami resigned as the central president of the women's organization immediately after the beginning of the People's War. He was fighting for the leadership when he was comfortable and also abolished the post of general secretary to build a united leadership. However, when difficult circumstances arose and she had to take on more responsibility, Hisala resigned. The meeting also accepted his resignation. The meeting has decided to create a platoon-level military organization of 11 to 15 people selected from the fighting parties in the target area and converted into the offensive area, and to develop this type of military organization gradually, without haste, one by one, according to regional policy. Fighters were temporarily centralized at the beginning of the Civil War, but now it has been decided to create a permanent platoon-level military structure. The far-reaching decision taken by this meeting is to seriously advance the work of building and expanding organizations among the lower classes and the people of new places. As this decision was taken seriously by all the leaders and activists, the expansion of the Maoist organization progressed rapidly and turned into a people's war. The cultural program during the Maoist period was a diverse and vibrant mix of traditional and revolutionary elements. The Maoists used culture as a powerful tool to mobilize people and spread their message. Traditional Nepali culture was an important part of the Maoist cultural program. The Maoists revived and promoted traditional Nepali music, dance, and theater. They also used traditional Nepali symbols and imagery in their propaganda. The Maoists also created new forms of culture that were more directly related to their revolutionary goals. They wrote and performed songs, sketches, and plays that were critical of the government and promoted the Maoist cause. They also created new forms of visual art, such as posters and murals, that spread the Maoist message. The Maoist cultural program was performed in a variety of venues, including villages, towns, and cities. The Maoists also held large cultural festivals that attracted thousands of people. Thank you. 
जंगल बाट मूव होना सकने पॉइंट अलग जंगल बाट वाच कर रामसंग दोसों पारी संभव ले बस कि भाई हो पारी खोला पारी तो खोला पारी बस यहाँ छेन हो During the 10-year People's War in Nepal, the Maoists effectively utilized technology, especially in the later years of the conflict, to communicate, coordinate, and spread their message. While their technology use was not as advanced as in some other conflicts, they employed various methods to achieve their goals: communication. The Maoists used radios and sometimes mobile phones for communication among their cadres. Radios were particularly valuable for communicating in remote and mountainous regions where other forms of communication were difficult. They also used couriers for sensitive information to avoid electronic surveillance, propaganda and recruitment. The Maoists utilized audio and video tapes as well as printed materials to spread their propaganda and ideologies they distributed pamphlets leaflets and other materials to recruit new members and gain public support for their cause social media and online platforms towards the latter part of the conflict as internet access became more widespread The Maoists started using online platforms and social media to disseminate their messages. This included websites, online forums, and social networking sites. Cyber warfare. While not as sophisticated as state-sponsored cyber operations, the Maoists did engage in some low-level cyber activities, including defacing government websites and spreading propaganda online. However, their cyber capabilities were limited compared to major state actors. Information warfare. The Maoists used technology to wage information warfare, spreading their narrative and countering the government's messages. They utilized various media channels to challenge the official discourse. and present their version of events to both domestic and international audiences there is limited information available on specific instances of the maoists hacking into radio and television broadcasts during the nepalese people's war however it's well documented that the maoists did engage in various forms of information warfare including disseminating their messages through both legal and illegal means Here's how they might have potentially disrupted radio and television broadcasts. Illegal transmissions. One method the Maoists might have used was illegal radio transmitters. They could set up their own broadcasting equipment in remote areas and broadcast their messages on frequencies used by mainstream radio and television stations, effectively disrupting regular programming with their own content. jamming signals another technique used by insurgent groups globally is jamming official broadcasts by transmitting interfering signals on the same frequency as a targeted radio or television station the maoists could disrupt the broadcast and replace it with their own content physical attacks In some cases, Maoist insurgents might have physically attacked radio and television stations to take them offline and replace regular programming with their own propaganda materials. Co-opting existing infrastructure. In certain instances, the Maoists might have gained control over existing radio or television stations. coercing or convincing station personnel to broadcast their messages this could involve threatening station staff or using force to take control of the broadcasting facilities the maoists used a variety of methods to hack into radio and television stations during the 10 year people's war one common method was to use a device called a transmitter a transmitter is a device that can be used to send radio or television signals 
The Maoists would use transmitters to send their own programs over the airwaves, interrupting the regular broadcasts. Another method that the Maoists used was to hack into the computers of radio and television stations. This allowed them to change the content of the broadcasts or to shut them down altogether. The Maoists were also known to use violence to gain access to radio and television stations. They would sometimes attack stations and take control of them by force. Here are some specific examples of how the Maoists hacked into radio and television stations during the Ten Year People's War. In 1996, the Maoists hacked into the radio station Radio Nepal and broadcast their own program. In 1997, the Maoists hacked into the television station Nepal Television and broadcast a program that was critical of the government. In 1998, the Maoists attacked a radio station in Rolpa district and took control of it. They used the station to broadcast their own programs. In 2000, the Maoists hacked into the computers of Nepal television and changed the content of a news broadcast. The Maoists' use of radio and television was an important part of their propaganda strategy. They were able to use these media to reach a wide audience and spread their message. The Maoists' use of radio and television was also a way to challenge the authority of the government. The Maoist People's War that started on 13th of February, 1996, ended peacefully in 2006. The 10-year People's War ended peacefully with a comprehensive peace agreement through the 12-point agreement with the seven parties. The Maoist People's War had turned the political course of Nepal in a different direction. In 10 years, the Maoist People's War became a topic of discussion and interest, not only in Nepal, but also worldwide. Some incidents of the Ten-Year People's War fought by the then Maoists are still discussed. On 13th of February 1996, the CPN Maoists started the People's War with the original slogan of destroying the reactionary state power and establishing a new democratic government. Attacks on outposts at Holeri in Rolpa, Athabiskot in Rukum, Sinduligari in Sinduli, and the Agricultural Development Bank in Changli in Gorkha. 18 February 1996, CPN Maoist General Minister Prachanda accepted responsibility for the attack through a press statement. February 1996, 14-year-old Dil Bahadur Ramtel was shot dead by the police in Gorkha. He was declared the first martyr of the People's War by the Maoists. 27 February 1996, Police killed six Khatri brothers in Pipal Rukum. June 1996. The second plan for the development of People's War, with the main slogan of developing guerrilla warfare in a planned manner, was launched by the meeting of the Central Committee of Maoists. 3rd of January 1997. Attack on the police station in Bethan, Ramachap. This is the first incident of a police station attack since the beginning of the People's War. During the attack, three militants, including Maoist Thirtha Gautam and female guerrilla Dilmaya Yonjan, died. 1997, June. The third plan was passed by the meeting of the Central Committee of the Maoists with the basic slogan, let's raise the guerrilla war to another new height of development. 1997. August, a police patrol was attacked and weapons looted in Tanahun's Kalakatar. Or February 1998, ambush explosion in Kare, dotting two rifles and Rs 20 lakh were looted from Nepal Bank Limited. 6th of February 1998, ambush attack against the police in Korchawang Nimri Rolpa. He killed two policemen and looted two rifles. 17th of March 1998, ambush explosion in Sarpani, Gorkha. Three policemen were killed and a rifle was looted. 1998 April, Operation Kilo Shera 2 by the government. 1998 August, 
the fourth extended meeting of the CPN Maoist Central Committee. Let's move towards the construction of the Adhar area, is the main slogan. 27 October 1998. Guerrillas attack the police station guarding Jimpe Tower in Salyan. An attack on the police station in Kavre's forest area in the east. On the same day, the police stations in Nirmalavasti in Parsa and Lalia in Danusha were attacked. During the continuation of the Bethan attack on 3rd of January, there was looting with all the weapons by the Badadanda Choki guerrillas of Lalitpur. In a February 1999, Chiragat police station attack in Dong. 19th of March 1999, seven artists who were taking shelter in Kavre's Anakote were set on fire by the police, burned alive, and shot dead. Siu May 1999, a riot police base camp in Jelwang Rolpa was attacked. 20th May 1999, Central member of CPN Maoist Dipendra Sharma, managing editor of Mandate Milan Nepali, former guerrilla platoon commander Naveen Gautam, and Kamala Sharma were arrested and disappeared. 14th of June 1999, riot base camp attack in Jajarkot Lake. 8 September 1999, CPN Maoist alternate Politburo member Suresh Wag Vasu was killed after his arrest in Gorkha. 22 September 1999, riot base camp attack in Mahat of Rukum DSP Thule Rai was kidnapped. 18 February 2000, Rolpa's Gartigaon riot IPR attack. After this, the police were centralized. Had April 2000, riot Ypres attack in Taxera of Rukum. Mid of April, Gorka's Hermi police patrol attack. 3 July 2000, Jajarkot Panchkatiya riot IPR attack. 23 August 2000. Nawal Parasi's attack on Dwadi IPR. 30 August 2000. Attack of Japa Mahawari IPR. 24th of September 2000. Attack on the headquarters for the first time. All police stations, bank robbery, and arson at Dolpa headquarters. 26 September 2000. Area police attack in Borlatar, Lamjung. 5 November 2000, Ramechhap's Doramba police station was attacked. 20 December 2000, District People's Government announcement for the first time. Purna Bahadur Garti Rukum District People's Government Chief. February 2001, the second national conference of CPN Maoists was held in Punjab, India. Prachandapath was passed from the conference. Prachanda was elected president, passed the concept of the South Asian Federation. The basic slogan was fixed as, let's strengthen and expand the base area and local government. Let's move in the direction of building a central people's government. 30 of March 2001. Jailbreak by 6. Gorkha female prisoners, Uma Bujal, Kamala Nakarmi, and others. Orst of April 2001. Riot camp at Rukumkot in Rukum. Police camp at Naumule in Dilek. And IPR attack at Mainapakari in Dolaka. 21 May 2001, local police station attack on Kanabanjang of Okaldhunga. 1st June 2001, palace massacre, death of King Barendra's entire family. Set June 2001, Maoist chairman Prachanda announced the end of the monarchy and insisted on the institutional development of the republic. 4th of June 2001, Adiraj Kumar Gyanendra Shah is declared king. 9 July 2001, Vishore police station attack in Lamjung. 12th of July 2001, 69 policemen were abducted in an early attack on the Hollery Post of Rolpa. Mobilization efforts of the Royal Army. 14th July 2001, Ramachap's Dowidanda police station attack. 19th July 2001, after King Gyanendra refused to mobilize the army against the Maoists, the then Prime Minister Girija Prasad Koirala resigned due to the same controversy. A new government was formed under the leadership of Sher Bahadur Duba. 24 July 2001, police station attack at Poklawang in Teratham. 27 July 2001, attack on police station in Pandusan, Bajura. 23 July 2001, 
the government announces a ceasefire. Immediately after that, a positive response to the ceasefire by the Maoists. 27th of July, 2001, a three-member Maoist negotiation team led by Krishna Bahadur Mahara, consisting of Agni Sapkota and Top Bahadur Rayamaji, was announced in Kirtipur. On the 14th, the first round of talks was held in Godavari. On the 28th to 29th, the second round of talks was held at Thakurdwar in Bardia. 15th August 2001, talks between various political parties and Maoists in Siliguri, India. A 13 November 2001, the third round of peace talks concluded again in Godavari. 21st of November 2001, the Maoist chairman urged people to be alert, stating that the government has closed the door to dialogue and a progressive political solution. 23 November 2001, John Mukti Sena, Nepal, announces Supreme Commander Prachanda. On the same day, the United Revolutionary People's Council of Nepal announced a 41-member committee under the leadership of Baburam Bhattarai. 23 November 2001, Maoist fighters attacked the Gorahi military barracks in Dang, Putla Bazar, and the headquarters in Siangja. 25 November 2001, in the east, during the Solakumbu headquarters salary attack by Maoist fighters, 137 security personnel were killed, including CDO. 26 November 2001, an emergency was announced by the Duba government. Formal mobilization of the Royal Nepali Army. Royal security personnel raided the offices of Manadasa Weekly and Jandisha Daily and arrested 11 journalists. 27 Sassanth. November 2001, operation started by the Royal Nepali Army. 7 December 2001, Nepal is shut down by the CPN Maoists, saying against state terror. 16th of February 2002, Maoists attack Akam headquarters and San Febagar airport. 55 soldiers and 150 policemen died in the clash. 2 May 2002, clash of Maoists with security personnel at Lizna Lake in Rolpa security base, camp attack by Maoist fighters. 22 May 2002, Duba dissolved parliament at midnight. Announcement of the Kartik 27 date for midterm elections. 27 May 2002, Krishna Sen Ichchuk, the former editor of Mandat, who was arrested on Jesta 6, was killed in custody. 16 June 2002, killing of Maoist central member Reet Bahadur Khadka in Rautahat. India bans all India Nepali Ekta Samaj by POTA law. 12 July 2002, India formally extradited four people, including journalists Maheshwar Dahal and Surendra Karki, Partha Chetri, who were arrested in Delhi on Asar 27, to Nepal for the first time despite widespread protests. 8 September 2002, local police station attack on Sandhi Kark, headquarters of Arga Kanchi, and Biman of Sinduli. 3rd of October 2002, parliamentarian parties petitioned the king to postpone the election after one year. 4th October 2002, dissolution of the Duba government by King Ginendra. He took the executive power himself. 14 November 2002, Karnali Regional Headquarters, Jumla Khalanga Maoist attack. 4 December 2002, the local police office and bank in Lahan were looted by the Maoists. 26 January 2003, Inspector General of Armed Police Krishna Mohan Shrestha and his wife were shot dead by Maoists while on a morning walk. 29 January 2003, both the government and the Maoists announced a ceasefire. 4 February 2003, the announcement of a five-member Maoist negotiation team led by Baburam Bhattarai, consisting of Ram Bahadur Thapa Badal, Krishna Bahadur Mahara, Dev Gurung, and Matrika Yadav. 12 February 2003, ceasefire code of conduct issued. Denied in March 2003, the negotiation team announced a press conference in the capital. 3rd April 2003, general meeting of Maoists in Kathmandu, addressed by members of the negotiation team. 7 April 2003, Talks of the first phase of the second ceasefire at the Shankar Hotel in Kathmandu. On the 27th, the second round of talks will be held at the same place. 17 August 2003, 
The third round of talks between the government and the Maoists was held in Nepalgunj and later in Danghapure. On the same day, 20 Maoist activists and one local were killed, along with Baburam Tamang, head of the district people's government, by the royal army in Doram of Ramechap. Negotiations were affected because the agreement that the Royal Nepali Army should not go beyond five kilometers from the barracks was broken. 27 August 2003, the CPN Maoists announced a ceasefire and broke off talks. Nationwide resistance warning, killing of Colonel Kiran Basnet of the Royal Nepalese Army by Maoists in Kathmandu. 27 October 2003. Four people, including police SP Suryakumar Shrestha, were killed in an ambush by Maoists in Gorkha Changli. 28 October 2003, joint Czech post attack at Dandanaka near Pokhara. O of November 2003, 10 royal security personnel were killed in an ambush at Parsa's Palwa Milan Chauk. O 7 November 2003, Inauguration of the Radio People's Republic of Nepal through a special message by the chairman of Maoist. 15 Nov 2003, death of Brigadier Sagar Bahadur Pandey of the Royal Nepalese Army in an ambush by Maoists on the Tribhuvan Rajpath section. 2003 to December, talks between Maoists and UML in Lucknow, India. 17 December 2003, 10 security personnel, including a lieutenant, were killed in an ambush by the Maoist army in the paddy fields of Kapilvastu. 9 January 2004. Declaration under the chairmanship of Santosh Buddha Magar in the People's Government of the Autonomous Republic of Magarat Thawang. Had 16 January 2004. Declaration of the Tamang Autonomous Republic People's Government hit Bahadur Tamang as president. 24 January 2004. Declaration of the Mahdez Autonomous Republic People's Government, Matrika Yadav, is in the lead. 29th of January 2004, Declaration of the Sedi Mahakali Autonomous Republic, People's Government President Lekraj Bhatt was elected. On the same day, under the chairmanship of Ram Karan Chaudhary, the Tharuwan Autonomous Republic of People's Government was announced. 3rd of January 2004, Declaration of the People's Government of the Tamuwan Autonomous Republic. Dev Gurung is in the lead. 2 February 2004. Declaration of the People's Government of the Kirat Autonomous Republic. Gopal Kambu Chief. 2004 February. Maoist leaders, Matrika Yadav and Suresh Ale Magar, were arrested by the Indian government and extradited to Nepal. To March 2004. Attack on Bhojpur headquarters by Maoists. 20 March 2004, attack on Beni, the headquarters of Mayagdi by Maoists. More than 150 security personnel were killed. 26 March 2004, Maoist Standing Committee member and Eastern Commander in Charge Mahan Baidya Kiran arrested by Indian police in Siliguri. 4 April 2004, attack on Yadakua police station in Danusha. 7 April 2004, Pashupatinagar Area Police Post Attack. 13 May 2004, Maoist Central Member and Commander of Mangalsan 1st Brigade, Nep Bahadur K.C. Parivartan, died in a bomb blast. 19 May 2004, clash between Maoists and security personnel in Gyantashwar, Doti. One and a half dozen security personnel were killed. 17th in June 2004, Akhil, the revolutionary, succeeded in withdrawing the charges of terrorism against the organization through various struggles, including a teaching strike. 2004 4 August. Let's make the first plan of revolution by the Central Committee of Maoists. Prepare comprehensively against foreign interference. Pass the plan of repatriation with the main slogan. 5th and September 2004, Maoist central members Sherman Kunwar and Mohanchandra Gautam were killed in Siraha. 16th of November 2004, ambush by Maoists in Krishnabir, Dading. A truck of the Royal Army was looted. After the video of the clash was broadcast by Nepal One Television, there was a big uproar. On the same day, Danusa's Mahendranagar EPR attack. 
The November 2004, eight royal security personnel were killed and weapons looted in a stampede at Caracola in Banque. 20 the November 2004, in an attack by Maoists on an army ranger battalion in Kailali's Pandan, 19 people were killed. 20th of November 2004, inauguration of the Nuwagaon Thuang Chunwang Sahi Motor Road Digging Campaign. 18th of December 2004, attack by Maoists in Sanku, local police station, Kathmandu. 22nd December 2004, 15 security personnel were killed in an attack on the army in Karnali, Chisapani. On January 2005, a Maoist ambush blasted Dankuta's Sutikola and 20 security personnel were killed. 1st February 2005, King Gyanendra removed the Duba government and formed a government under his chairmanship. Maoist chairman's appeal against royal coup. 9th May 2005, Maoists attacked army barracks in Siraha's Bandapur and armed barracks in Mirchaya. 6 June 2005, Maoists killed 42 people, including three security personnel in an ambush on a passenger bus in Chitwan's Bandar Mood. Dozens of people were injured. 10th of June 2005, Maoist attack on the Royal Nepali Army at Narke in Kavre. After that, another patrol was attacked in Gartachap. 22 security personnel were killed in both attacks. Toda June 2005, Maoists attacked the army in Bhojpur's Pandare. Eight people were killed. 25th of June 2005, Maoists attacked the army in Kanda, Arga Kanchi. 19 people, including a lieutenant, were killed. 7 August 2005, attack on the Royal Military Camp at Pili in Calicut. A large number of security personnel were killed, including youths who had joined the army. A large number of weapons were stolen. Or October 2005, unilateral ceasefire announced by the CPN Maoist. 22nd November 2005, the 12 point agreement between the Satdal and the Maoists was announced. 28th November 2005, the decisions of the Central Committee meeting were announced by the Maoists. The second plan of invasion is the announcement of the military strategy of hitting on the back and hitting on the head. 29 November 2005, Division Commander Kim Bahadur Thapa Sunil was killed by a bullet fired from a helicopter by the Royal Nepalese Army. Since December 2005, one month more in unilateral ceasefire by Maoists. 2 January 2006, declaration of a ceasefire by Maoists. 14th of January 2006, Maoists attacked the Thangkot and Dadikot areas of the capital. 21 January 2006, Palpa headquarters, Tansen attack and arson by West Military Command. 8th of February 2006, the municipal elections announced by the royal government failed due to the boycott of Maoists and seven parties. 9th of February 2006, attack on five truck forces of the Royal Nepalese Army in Sunwal of Rupandehi by the Western Military Command of the Maoists. 25 soldiers were killed and weapons were looted. 6th of April 2006, seven parties, the Maoist Joint Peaceful Movement, started. 24th April 2006. The Peaceful Joint People's Movement was successful with wide public participation. The King accepted the demands of the seven protesting parties and restored the disbanded House of Representatives. 24 April 2006, the announcement to continue the movement, saying that they were attacked by the Maoists. 18 May 2006, announcement of the election of the Constituent Assembly through the meeting of the restored House of Representatives. 26 May 2006, the 25-point ceasefire code of conduct was released through the first top-level talks between the Nepalese government and the leaders of the Maoist side. 16th June 2006, in talks between the Nepal government, seven parties and Maoists, Maoist chairman Prachanda Baluatar, from his long underground life, made public an eight-point agreement. 9th of August 2006, the Maoist government sent a joint letter to the United Nations. In November 2006, historic summit talks between seven parties, Maoists, six-point peace agreement. 
the decision of the royal institution will be decided by the first meeting of the Constituent Assembly. 24 November 2006. On behalf of the government, Prime Minister Girija Prasad Koirala and Maoist Chairman Prachanda signed a 10-point historic peace agreement announcing the end of the 10-year Maoist People's War. Criticism within the party that this decision of Prachanda is not party or institutional. 15th January 2007. The interim constitution of Nepal is released, along with the decision to hold constituent assembly elections. Worst April 2007. Formation of an interim government with CPN Maoists. Constituent assembly elections were held in Nepal for the first time on 10 April 2008. <laughs> Nepal's John Andalan, 2062-2063, or John Andalan II, was a peaceful movement in Nepal that lasted for 19 days. This movement overthrew the 237-year-old monarchy and established a democratic republic in the country. Various political parties and the Maoists, who were fighting an armed conflict, were also involved in this movement. In the year 2058, King Birendra, who was the head of state of Nepal, and all his family members were killed in Narayanhidi. After that, his brother Gyanendra sat on the throne as the new king of Nepal. In the same year, a state of emergency was imposed in the country, but neither the Maoist People's War was stopped, nor could an agreement be reached between the parties. As a result, the king dissolved the elected parliament and took power into his own hands. The king was able to take this step because some provisions regarding state power and the rights of the king were not clear in the Constitution of the Kingdom of Nepal 2047. In a country without a parliament, the king changed the cabinet under the leadership of different people. And finally, King Gyanendra took all the power in his hands and formed a new cabinet under his own chairmanship through a proclamation on Ma 19. 2061. After that, the transmission lines of telephones and mobiles across the country were cut. Radio, TV, newspapers, and other media were controlled. Fundamental rights were also banned. This move by King Gyanendra was opposed globally, both inside and outside the country. Political parties were on the move. A coalition of different political parties continued to protest against the king's move, but it did not bring any change for a long time. Meanwhile, between the CPN Maoist and the seven protesting political parties who are engaged in an armed war, a 12-point agreement was reached in February 2062 in New Delhi with the mediation of India. After that, along with other political parties, the Maoists also participated in the peaceful people's movement by laying down their arms. Altogether, there was a movement. Despite the widespread suppression of the security forces, a sea of people took to the streets. The king announced on the 8th of Baisak that he had returned the people's noses to them. But the movement did not stop. And in a speech on the 11th of Baisak, after announcing that the dissolved parliament had been restored according to the roadmap of seven political parties, the establishment of democracy was established. The civil war brought significant political and social changes. Nepal transitioned into a federal democratic republic, ending the monarchy. Nepal, a land of resilience, has come a long way. Its civil war remains an indelible part of its history a reminder of the enduring spirit of its people. In the end, Nepal's unforgotten struggle is a testament to the power of hope, reconciliation, and the pursuit of a brighter future. <laughs>
समय र मौसम को हमी माथि दबाव छ म अहिले यहाँ तपाईहरु को अगाडि कुनै भाषण गर्न उपस्थित भएको छैन म केही प्रतिबद्धता प्रतिबद्धता र केही अनुभूति मात्रै राख्न चाहन्छु आजको दिन एउटा ऐतिहासिक नेपाली जनताको छवि विश्वमा एउटा महान राष्ट्र र महान जनताका रूपमा स्थापित भयो आदरणीय जनसमुदाय यो महान राष्ट्र र महान जनता कसरी हुन सक्यो एउटा चीज छोड्ने गरिएको छ त्यो त्यो मौलिक सृजना त्यो मौलिक विचार त्यो मौलिक मान्यता सशस्त्र विद्रोह र शान्तिपूर्ण जनविद्रोह हजारौं शहीदहरुको बलिदानको बीचबाट एउटा विचार बन्छ तपाई हामीलाई थाहा छ अहिले राज्यको अग्रगामी पुनर्संरचना वर्गीय जातीय क्षेत्रीय लिङ्गीय समस्याको समाधान हुने गरी अग्रगामी पुनर्संरचनाको कुरा छ अहिले विचारमा विचार र नेतृत्वको अन्तर विरोध परेको छ हामी सबैले ध्यान दिनु छ तेस्रो कुरा म भन्न चाहन्छु कि संविधान सभाको निर्वाचन कुनै पनि मूल्यमा गणतन्त्रको घोषणा हुनुपर्छ जनताले